Our speaker tonight requires no special introduction, which is why it is always a special task to introduce him nevertheless. I will keep it short. Uh, since it is impossible to follow the immense volume of work Slavoj Žižek has written in the field of political philosophy, let me just pre present two works which were most important for me, at least recently. The first one I would like to mention is called Three Lectures Slavoj Žižek Held at the Occasion of the Establishment of the Society for Theoretical Psychoanalysis, end of quote. It's a pretty long, uh, pretty long um, title. Uh, these lectures were held in 1982, and it is perhaps noteworthy that it is now 40 years since the establishment of the Society uh, for Theoretical Psychoanalysis. These lectures, I think, are incredibly contemporary, even though they were written in the 80s when self-management was still the name of the political game in Yugoslavia. Published in the legendary journal Problemi, they include many of the char characteristic Zizekian concepts. And secondly, a book of Zizek which I recently come to read quite a lot. Uh, it is called Absolute Recoil Towards a New Foundation of Dialectical Materialism, published by Verso in 2014. The term absolute recoil appears in Hegel's Science of Logic. In German, it is called absolute Gegenstoss. And Zizek takes it as the concept of political community which is profoundly groundless. That is to say, the idea is that the political relations do not repose on any positive, affirmative ground. Their legitimacy is always to be considered, in a way, a self-caused. Finally, uh, I think it is, uh, I, I will leave it at that, and I will simply invite Slavoj Žižek to come to the stage and deliver his talk. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. I hope this works. It's a great honor for me to be here. And since I usually speak for too long, I will simply begin. I want to begin by thanking Alenka Zupancic, Mladen Dolar, as well as my colleagues from abroad, especially Yuval Kremnitzer, Eric Sentner, and Aaron Schuster, I rely heavily on all of them in what will follow. There is a narrative gradually emerging of what is going on in the last decades. It is the return of what was repressed in the age of modernity and enlightenment. More precisely, the antagonism is not just the one between enlightenment and its repressed. It is at its most basic, the antagonism which runs through the Enlightenment edifice itself. Back to the ancient Greece, the antagonism between Plato and Aristotle, French Revolution and English Reform, politics and economy, egalitarian freedom and liberty rooted in customs. It is the antagonism between radical egalitarian universalism and particular experimental approach. And the truth is by far not on the side of cautious empirical approach. We are learning the hard way that the attempt of modernity to dispense with traditional forms of domination, father of the family, master, failed and that the dimension of the master is returning with a vengeance in all its forms, patriarchal values, political authoritarianism, obscene master clown, religious fundamentalism, and so on. It was clear already to Sigmund Freud that the decline of the paternal authority is an ambiguous process. Father as a figure of moral authority enables the child to adopt a stance of moral autonomy, resisting the pressure of his or her or its peers, and the pressure of the corrupted social environment. Following Freud in his study on authority and family written back in 1930s, Max Horkheimer made the same point 
weil in the same spirit Adorno pointed out that Hitler is not a paternal figure. So if you are anti-patriarchal, congratulations, you have Hitler and Stalin on your side. The most visible form of this return of the repressed is the obscene master, a new figure, perhaps, of Freud's Urfather, primordial father. Once traditional authority loses its substantial power, it is not possible to return to it. All such returns are today a postmodern fake. Does Donald Trump enact traditional values? No, his conservatism is a postmodern performance, a gigantic ego trip. In this sense of obscenity, playing with traditional values, of mixing references to them with public obscenities, Donald Trump is the ultimate postmodern president. If we compare Trump with, let's say, Bernie Sanders, Trump is a postmodern politician at its purest, while Sanders is an old fashioned moralist. This situation makes what remains of the left desperate. There was a mix of fascination and horror present in the left liberal reaction to the Trumpian crowd invading the Capitol on January 6, 21. Ordinary people breaking into the sacred seat of power, a carnival that momentarily suspended our rules of public life. There was a little bit of envy in their condemnation of the event. Many of my leftist friends told me we should have been doing this. So does this mean that the populist right stole from the left the last resort of their resistance to the existing system, the popular attack on the seat of power? The problem is that the people to which populism refers doesn't exist. Populism is by definition a mask of power. It is a fantasized entity evoked by the new masters to justify their rule as the servants of the people, enabling them to dismiss their opponents as the enemies of the people. The first step towards populism was made centuries ago when, to counter the loss of traditional authority, the leader, king, proclaimed himself a servant. Uh, uh, Friedrich the Great defined himself as the first servant of the state. And this is how, from the early Enlightenment onwards, a master justifies his rule. He is in reality the greatest servant, the servant of all his subjects' servants. But there are different modalities of this position of serving the servant. From technocracy and liberal democracy to authoritarianism. The reaction to this predicament, this integration of traditional authority, is double. We can reluctantly accept the need to return to some form of social authority. Some Lacanians claim that the problem today is the decline of the name of the father of the paternal symbolic authority. In its absence, pathological narcissism explodes, evoking the specter of the primordial real father. Consequently, that's their idea, we should try to restore some kind of law as the agent of prohibition. Although this idea is to be rejected, it correctly points out how the decline of the master in no way automatically guarantees emancipation, but can well engender new, much more oppressive figures of domination. Is, however, the return to prohibition sustained by some new figure of the law the only way out? It seems that the very last Lacan, aware of this problem, 
proposed another solution which Jacqueline Miller calls cynical. We cannot return to the authority of the law, but what we can do is act as if we sustain the law. We should maintain its authority as necessary, although we know it is not true. In short, Miller's solution is we are psychotics who try to play normal hysterics. Miller has fearlessly spelled out the political implications of this stance. A psychoanalyst, quote from Miller, acts so that semblances remain at their places while making sure that the subjects under his psychoanalyst's care do not take them as real. One should protect the semblances of power for the good reason that one should be able to continue to enjoy. The point is not to attach oneself to the semblances of the existing power, but to consider them necessary." End of quote. I hope you notice that Miller repeats here, literally, the famous formula from Kafka's trial. The law is not true, it is just necessary. The TV spectacle we were able to watch a couple of days ago, the ceremony of Queen Elizabeth Burial, provides another way of how authority survive, survives. The more, not only the British monarchy, but also United Kingdom as a state, lost its superpower status and became a local power, the more the status of the British royal family became the stuff of ideological fantasies of all, all around the world. According to some estimates, the ceremony of Queen's uh, funeral was watched by four billion people around the world. We should not dismiss this as ideology masking actual power relations. The British royal fantasy is one of the key components which enable actual power relations to reproduce themselves. This fantasy doesn't concern only the present royal family. Remember how in 2012, the skeleton excavated in a parking place in Leicester was identified as that of Richard III. He was reburied in Leicester Cathedral on 26th of March 2015, and again, the ceremony, where only a hundred or so people were expected, was witnessed by over 100,000 people. Facts like this cannot be dismissed as reactionary fantasies. The correct insight they bear is the distinction between the symbolic top head of power and the actual executive power. Kings and queens reign, they don't rule, and their reign is ceremonial and as such crucial. This is why the Stalinist leader is the very opposite of a monarch. He is definitely not a traditional master, also not an obscene master, and also not an agent, of course, of liberal democratic stance or of contemporary scientific knowledge based on rational reasoning and experimentation. He is rather a pathological distortion of the university discourse, the return of its repressed. In Stalinism, the master signifier directly overlaps with the space of knowledge. There is no post-truth here, no obscene multiplicity and self-irony, but a knowledge acting as truth itself. This is why today's China, in which appearances of an all-knowing power are fully protected, is the opposite to Trump, but within the same space. The other way to deal with the decline of traditional authority is the anarchist way. 
The idea is let's go to the end and get rid of the master in all its dimensions. Anarchism is having a revival today. From Noam Chomsky to David Graeber, anarchism is not against public power. Catherine Malabou, another Hegelian neo-anarchist, refers to Jacques Rancière who asserts radical equality between citizens who are considered able to both command and obey. There is an essential relationship between the lot, in the sense of lottery, and democratic expression. True democracy relies on the contingency of who governs and who is governed, because governing does not require any particular skill. Now, in his reply to Malabu, Etienne Balibar goes to the crux of the problem. Quote from Balibar. The anarchist will say that we are able to imagine and realize in practice an alternative social fabric because the whole society could, one way or another, emerge from forms of self-government and self-organization that can be experienced and experimented with at the level of cooperatives, towns, and so on. Today, this idea is becoming increasingly influential, and people give us examples of what the Kurdish fighters tried in Rojava, what the Zapatistas are trying in Chiapas, and so forth. From there, they, anarchists, extrapolate and say that works that say what works at the local level could work at the global level, provided you find the right form of federation. End of quote. <coughs> Sorry. Malabu herself points out two problems with this anarchist stance. First, anarchism is becoming today a key feature of global capitalism. Another quote from Malabu, our current epoch is characterized by a coexistence between a de facto anarchism and a dawning or awakening anarchism. De facto anarchism is the reign of anarcho-capitalism, which is contemporaneous with the end of the welfare state, creating in citizens a feeling of abandonment. Just think of the state of hospitals and healthcare today. Current capitalism is undertaking its anarchist or liber libertarian turn, a generalized uberization, referring to uber, of life, end of quote. Second, this anarcho-capitalism is the other side of new authoritarianism. Another quote from Malabu, Authoritarianism does not contradict the disappearance of the state. It is its messenger. The mask of, this so -called, of the so-called collaborative economy, which, by bringing professionals and users into direct contact through technological platforms, pulverizes all fixity, end of quote. One should only add here that this mask is not only a mask, it is also the hidden truth of the anarchic collaborative economy. What this means is that the rising authoritarianism is the other side of the disappearance of the state, more precisely of the state's most precious function, that of providing public services. At, do you remember, at the end of June 21, a heat dome over the northwest of the United States and the southwest of Canada caused temperatures to approach 50 degrees Celsius. This local phenomenon was the result of a global disturbance of patterns which clearly depend on human interventions into the natural cycles. So we have to act against it globally with a tight cooperation between states. A state is often all we have when we are in an emergency state. 
natural disaster, pandemic, and so on. We thereby touch the vast domain of public services, healthcare, education, which cannot be provided through expanding cooperatives and other forms of local self-organization. Balibar makes this point clear, a quote. If you look at the poor in American suburbs, mainly African Americans and other migrant groups, what they suffer from is the fact that America never really had a welfare state or a social state in the British, French, or German, or German sense. The catastrophe for them is not that there is too much state. It is that there is not enough of the state." End of quote. So yes, popular mobilization outside party politics and state apparatuses is needed. Just recall the 8th of March initiative here in Slovenia. But communities evoked by anarchists rely on a thick sec texture of alienated institutional mechanisms. Where do electricity and water come from? What guarantees the rule of law? To whom do we turn for healthcare? The more a community is self-ruling, the more this network has to function smoothly and invisibly. Maybe we should change the goal of emancipatory struggles from overcoming alienation to enforcing the right kind of alienation, achieving a smooth functioning of alienated, invisible social mechanisms which sustain the space of non-alienated communities. Critics of representative democracy endlessly vary the motive of how, for a priori former reasons, multi-party elections betray true democracy. But it is because of such a minimal alienation, signaled by the term representative, that a democracy eventually functions. Does this mean that expertise doesn't matter? No, since another separation enters the frame here. The separation, the separation between, in Lacanian terms, S1 and S2, master signifier and expert knowledge. The master people in a democracy through voting formally decides, makes the choice, but the experts suggest them what to choose. People want to the appearance of choice, not real choice making. In this sense, in a democracy, every ordinary citizen is effectively a king but a king in the sense of constitutional democracy, a king who only formally decides whose function is to sign measures proposed by executive administration. This is why the problem of democratic rituals is homologous to the big problem of constitutional democracy. How to protect the sorry, constitutional monarchy, how to protect the dignity of the king, how to maintain the appearance that the king effectively decides when we all know this is not true. There is thus in free elections always a minimal aspect of politeness. Those in power politely pretend that they do not really hold power and ask us to freely decide if we want to give them power. All this, I think, mirrors the status of Russia in 1990s. It was still recognized as a superpower on condition that it didn't act, that one. And Putin stopped to play this game. Uh, today, this political politeness is disappearing. And since politeness is a crucial feature of what Lacan calls the big other, the symbolic substance of our being, no wonder many Lacanians claim that the big other is disintegrating. We all know how absolutely crucial appearances were in Stalinism. The Stalinist regime reacted with total panic 
whenever there was a threat that appearances will be disturbed, say that some accident will render clear the failure of the regime and so on. There were in the Soviet media no black chronicles, no reports on crime and prostitution and so on. What characterizes Stalinism is precisely this conjunction of raw, brutal terror and the need to protect appearances. Even if we all know something is not true, the big other of appearances should not notice it. So we have, no, I'm sorry, I don't have more time to develop this, but usually we say in the West we are at least superficially polite, manipulated under Stalinism, it's real power. No, quite the opposite. Stalinism was brutal power, but at the same time a rule of appearances which absolutely should not be disturbed. So we have to be very cautious when we talk about the disintegration of the big other. This disintegration is not a straightforward pro process of approaching what Jacqueline Miller called generalized foreclosure, a state in which the big other no longer serves as the symbolic space in which subjects communicate. Is, but, I disagree with this, is the chaotic digital space of fake news nonetheless not a new form of big other, a chaotic public space in which influencers fight for numbers of clicks. When we engage in spreading fake or not news on Facebook, we are not directly ourselves there. We are playing a certain role in this new big other. And is the space of cancel culture also not a very strict form of the big other in which those cancelled are excluded from the public space. This is why the description of the generalized foreclosure as a carnival without limitation in which every entity is an exception is misleading. Duane Roussel, one of those who maintain this notion of generalized disclosure, claims, quote, Today, the exception has become universal. The carnival has become a carnival without limitation of place, thanks to the power of the virtual, which has modified the category of perceptual space, end of quote. But, but is there really no limitation in this carnival? Does the limitation, in some sense, much stronger than the paternal prohibition which at least solicits the desire to transgress it? Is it not returning with a vengeance in the politically correct, woke, or cancel culture? The characterization of woke as racism in the time of the many without the one may appear problematic, but I think it hits the mark. In an almost exact opposite to the traditional racism, which opposes a foreign intruder posing a threat to the unity of the one, say, immigrants or Jews, Vogue reacts to those who are suspected not only not to truly abandon old forms of the one, patriots, proponents of patriarchal val values, Eurocentrists, and so on. This is why the Vogue stands provides the supreme case of how permissiveness turns over into universal prohibition. In a politically correct regime, we never know if and when some of us will be cancelled for his, her, its acts or words. The criteria themselves are murky. So, to conclude, here are some points, problematic to most of you, no doubt, on which I must insist. First, a true master is not an agent of discipline and prohibition. His message is not you cannot, and also not you have to, but a 
releasing you can. You can what? Do the impossible. Do what appears impossible within the coordinates of the existing constellation. And today, this means something very precise. You can think beyond capitalism and liberal democracy as the ultimate framework of our lives. A master is a vanishing mediator who gives you back to yourself, who delivers you to the abyss of your freedom. When you listen to a true leader, you discover that you want, or rather, you always wanted something without knowing it. A master is needed because we cannot accede our freedom directly. For to gain this access, we have to be pushed from outside of our natural state, which is one of inert hedonism, one of what Alain Badiou called human animal. The more we live as free individuals with no master, the more we are effectively not free, caught within the existing frame of possibilities. We need, we have to be pushed, disturbed into freedom by a master. Next point. We shouldn't strive for a self-transparent order with no alienation, but for an order of good alienation of our reliance on thick invisible cobweb of regulations which sustain the space of our freedom. We should be led to trust this cobweb and ignore it, focusing on how to invent a different mode of passivity, focusing on how to cope with the unavoidable alienation of political life. The moment one takes a close look at an actual state power edifice, one can easily detect an implicit but unmistakable signal. If, even if uh, the state power is, I don't know how democratic, its message between the lines is always, forget about our limitations. Ultimately, we can do whatever we want with you. My position I like this excess. This excess is not a contingent supplement spoiling the purity of power, but it's necessary constituent. Without it, without the threat of arbitrary omnipotence, state power is not a true power, it loses its authority. And again, to make my point clear, we have to stop playing games of limiting power to a rational democratic extent. We have to accept the excess of power fully. It is the Trumpian populists who undermine it. So in all these cases, a false opposition is left behind. We don't overcome alienation with desalienation. We don't overcome master by eliminating a master. We don't overcome public power by limiting it to useful public services. The non-alienated autonomous liberal individual is itself a product of alienation in capitalist society. A master effectively serving the people, taking care of them, is a fetish created to prevent the possibility that individuals will take care of themselves. The idea of power serving society justifies power and thus obfuscates its constitutive excess. But does this not involve a contradiction with Lacan's well-known claim that there is no big other? How to read together the fact that big other doesn't exist, and the utter self-sacrificial reliance that I advocate on the figure of some big other. The obvious reading of the fact that there is no big other would have been for the bearer of authority to admit openly to those subjected to him that he is not qualified 
to exert, to exert authority and to simply step down, leaving his subjects to confront reality as they can. Hannah Arendt outlines this gesture apropos parental authority. Quote, modern man could find no clearer expression for his dissatisfaction with the world, for his disgust with things as they are, than by his refusal to assume in respect to his children responsibility for all this. It is as though parents daily said, in this world even we are not very securely at home, how to move about in it, what to know, what skills to master are mysteries for us too. You must try to make out as best as you can. In any case, you are not entitled to call us to account. We are innocent, we wash our hands of you." End of quote. Now, although this imagined answer of the parents is factually more or less true, it is nonetheless existentially false. A parent cannot wash his, her, its hands in this way. The same goes for saying, I have no free will, my decisions are the product of my brain signals, of social influences, so I wash my hands. I have no responsibility for crimes that I committed. Even if this is factually true, it is false as my subjective stance. This means that, to quote Aaron Schuster, who sits here, the ethical lesson is that the parents should pretend to know what to do and how the world works, for there is no way out of the problem of authority other than to assume it. In its very fictionality, with all the difficulties and discontents this entails. End of quote. But again, are we here not back at the cynical position? Authority is a fake, but it's a necessary fake. No, because to quote Miller himself, the cynical position resides in saying that enjoyment is the only thing that is true. But in the case evoked by Hannah Arendt, the fiction is more true than reality. We are ready to risk our life for the fiction precisely because it is a fiction. We are here back at Lacan's The Truth Has the Structure of a Fiction. The same goes for the relationship between determinism and freedom. Radical acts of freedom are possible only under the condition of predestination. In predestination, we know we are predestined, but we don't know how we are predestined. Which of our choices is predetermined. And this terrifying situation where we have to decide what to do, knowing that our decision is decided in advance, is perhaps the only case of real freedom. I hope you understood what I'm saying here. Something crazy, but I think it's existentially true. Freedom, radical freedom, is not, oh, I go to a patisserie, strawberry cake, cheesecake, I can choose, no. Radical freedom is that I know everything is predetermined, but I don't know in what way. And I, I have to decide what is, uh, what is predetermined. So we have to take a risk and subjectively choose what is predetermined. This is the paradox with which I want to conclude. There is no big other, doesn't mean that if there is no God, then everything is permitted. As Lacan knew it, it means the exact opposite. Everything is prohibited, and to break out of this prohibition, I have to act counterfactually. There is no big other, is not a cold description of the state of things. Such description implies that I occupy the place of a big other, a neutral view on reality, in the same sense that universal historicism exempts me from historical relativism. 
There is no big other means that in a maximum of subjective engagement, I have to identify myself as a hole in the big other, as a crack in its edifice. So to go to the end, one has to correct Lacan here. The ultimate, most radical, subjective position is not that of the analyst. That's the usual psychoanalytic idea when you discover there is no big other, that we are in an abyss, this is as far as we can go. No, I think that after achieving this, after traversing the fantasy and assuming that there is no big other, the only way to avoid cynicism is to heroically pass to the position of a new master. At this point, where things get really philosophical, I want to stop. Thank you very much. Uh, Slavoj, thank you very much um, for, for your thoughts. A lot of uh, things that you said uh, resonate, uh, resonates really well with uh, how the discussions today have been turning. There has been some uh, movement, especially in the afternoon session, towards the idea that maybe master isn't so bad. Absolutely. But not only this. Are you aware, sorry to interrupt you, are people aware what I was really saying? A, democracy functions only as a fake, Fake in the sense that it's the play of politeness. I want, to, I want the appearance to decide as an ordinary man. I don't want really to decide. Point two, I totally reject this liberal, just repeating my provocative ideas, this liberal view that government, yes, it's necessary, but in a limited way. We ordinary people should say, okay, we allow the government to do this, that. No, I think that what makes a government functioning is precisely this excessive threat. Mm -hmm. Ha ha, ultimately forget about democratic limitations. I can do whatever I want. And I think, I don't have time to develop this now, that precisely in Stalinism, this is not the case. They always, the whole, uh, the whole machinery there, symbolic machinery is that of, is that of, is that of serving, uh, is that of uh, uh, serving the people, mm -hmm. no? So my position is here uh, very clear. And we not only need, uh, and third point, now I'm addressing you personally. Can you imagine, I cannot, it's a rhetorical question, to live in a real local community where there is no higher power, where every afternoon you have some boring self-management meetings where you have to decide how to get... No, I want to live in a good alienation. Okay, but let, let me press you on this. Let me press okay, you on okay, this. Okay, that's what I want how do you, to how do you, you. How do you. How do you imagine this... Master, I remember a joke uh, that you uh, told many years ago, which was a very effective joke, but it was a joke nevertheless. The, yeah. the joke went, the old pre-modern father says, uh, you have to go to your grandmother, yeah. uh, and then you just had to go. Uh, but then the modern, the postmodern father says, um, you know how your grandmother loves you, so you still have to go but now you also have to like it. I'm telling your joke. This is one of the famous Slava's joke. However, I mean, are you saying that you want the pre-modern father back? You're probably not saying that. I want, uh, of course, I want neither of these okay. two. Thank you. But, but <laughs> I wanted no, 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 no. I wanted wait that to minute, be really clear. I but wanted... it, that, this doesn't mean somewhere in between. I hope you told it for understandable reason in a shortened way, no? Okay. You know, what's my point? I experienced it myself. There is a certain type of authority when the father, it's Sunday afternoon, we have to visit grandmother. A really oppressive father will not tell you, behave properly, you have to go. A really oppressive father will tell you, you know how much your visit would have meant to your grandmother, but go only if you really want. Beneath this free choice, there is a redoubled order. Mm. You not only have to 
visit grandmother, you have to freely decide to visit it. Mm. And as an American friend of mine, forgot his name now, develop, this is uberization and so on. This is the everyday life of today's capitalism. How uh, uh, more and more companies where you have precarious workers work in this way. You can choose uh, uh, to work, how do you call it, more than your work time, additionally. And you are free to choose. But if you don't choose this, you can be fired. Mm. So literally, your job relies on your haha free decision to do more. Now, my totalitarian... Okay, but, 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 but then I want to press you on this, on, on the question of freedom, because this is, this is also something uh, you mentioned, that you do not believe in freedom in the sense of going to the uh, uh, boulangerie. At some be, okay, the, you will get my provocative okay. answer. At some level, basic level, and we should isolate this point, I think that this is not just a crazy neo-totalitarian phenomenon, this... To cut a long story short, you are given a choice only if you make the right choice. I think this is what I call civilization. At a certain basic level, that's our stance towards society. And I totally accept it. Mm. I endorse it. I, I will repeat, if I may, probably most of you know it, but you do. My hero is a colleague of mine, uh, 40 years ago almost, he went to serve the Yugoslav army. And in the army, it was after the first two weeks there, you, uh, we have the oath, you know. Everybody had to repeat, I am ready to sacrifice blah, 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 my life, and then to sign it. And my friend did an ingenious thing. He... Uh, when he confronted the officer with a big fat book where he would have to sign his name, he said, am I compelled, are you ordering me to sign this? Officer says, of course not, oath must be a free oath. Then my friend said, then I will not sign it. Then the officer told him, are you crazy? You will be arrested. And he got into a debate, and since the officer was rather stupid, at the end, he produced a paper, which my friend still has, ordering my friend to freely sign the oath. <laughs> and what I'm trying to tell you is that, yes, at a certain basic level, we need this. Because, uh, uh, you know, we can go here into theology even. Let's do it. Yeah, because uh, Kierkegaard says this very nicely. He says that the worst, most atheist think is to behave as a free, reasonable being and to say, okay, I read Quran, Old Testament, New Testament, Buddhist, and I think Christianity is the best, it convinced me. Kierkegaard says this is the worst. The true religious authority works in exactly the opposite way. In order to Really, be, in order to understand the arguments for Christianity, you already have to believe it. If you think in the other way around, you are already a secular atheist. Now, idiots will say, my God, but are you, uh, are you a middle-aged obscurantist? What has this to do with enlightenment? The whole point of Marx is exactly the same. What Marx calls emancipatory radical proletarian position, it's not, Stalin speaks like this. Stalin says, as a Marxist, how do you become a Marxist? You look around, you see historical necessity goes towards communism. Oh, let's choose to bet on the winning horse, you choose that. No, Marx says the exactly opposite. To understand Marxism, you have already to be a Marxist. And I want to insist on the irreducibility of this. So you see here my position gets more complicated. I, uh, uh, I, am, uh, I think that the problem, now I will be very brutal, the problem of this postmodern father is that he is right, but what he should do is to become openly oppressive. 
I, uh, my father is not the one who tells you, go to your grandmother, I don't care what you feel. My uh, father tells you, but openly, not look deep, but you have to like to go to your grandmother. Okay, okay thank you or, very much. But uh, you will say this is madness, but uh, sorry, just to conclude the Vatican study, before you dismiss me in an, uh, as an authoritarian madman, aren't we, our every, uh, aren't we encountering similar positions? This is what fascinates me most. At everyday level, all the time, for example, let's say, let's say I invite you, another old joke, you know of mine, at a dinner. And it's clear since, let us say, who knows what will be 10 years from now, I have much more money than you, I invite you. So, but don't we have the ritual that when the bill arrives, you have to say, okay, let's split it and so on. I have to make the gesture of reaching. Yeah, to, the gesture. Yeah. No? I and have to pretend. My, and, but then we all know then in half a minute you will concede, which is why here I will show you my true evil. Sometimes I like to do to my friends and say, okay, you pay. <laughs> then the usual idea is you reach into your pocket and say, oh my God, I forgot the credit card. It's another game. But you see what I mean. I want to assert that being a member of society is not as liberal thing, a simple free choice. You are never outside. The moment you speak and so on, a certain basic choice, which is in the strict Schellingian, Freudian way, an eternal transcendental choice, it's an a priori, is already made. Mm. So this is one aspect of the master. But my solution to go to the end is this one. There are normal states, although very unjust they can be, and uh, states of emergency. In normal states, a uh, master, of course, should be reduced to an idiot. That's why I have even a certain sympathy for monarchy and so on. As Hegel knew it, monarchs are idiots by definition. God save us from monarchs who are too wise. Monarchs have to have good manner, say some wise platitudes and so on. And as you, this, the stuff of monarchs are like proverbs, deep wisdoms. And I'm sorry, just the last of my sure. jokes, very brief. Like, uh, I hate proverbs and wisdoms. My eternal example, sorry if you know you. Let's say that I do something risky and I succeed. And sorry, not you, you. Let's say you are the wise idiot and I succeed. And then you are immediately able to quote some proverb. We in Slovene have, kdo riskira profitira, only those who risk profit, like. Let's say that I fail. Then you will be uh, immediately able to quote another pro, like we have in Slovene this vulgar one, ne mors prodvetrus cat, you cannot urinate against the wind. This is the stuff of a monarch. Okay. The less intelligent the monarch is, so there is a chance to reduce the monarch to this symbolic, empty head. But sometimes in exceptional states, we need a more real master, but this master has to be, it's still a figure of transference. Look at great figures, I spoke with people, I'm not totally bluffing, don't be afraid, I will end. With people, I was lucky, who knew Mandela and Václav Havel. And they all told me, don't overestimate them. They were rather flat idiots. The point was what we put in them, the message we got from them. Not obey me, but yes, we can, yes, you can do it. Mm. That's all. So at the same time, all the glory to the master, but just ceremonial, but this cere ceremony is empty, but necessary. All right, thank Sorry you. Sorry if I was... No, 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 this is, uh, this is fantastic. This again resonates oh, I wouldn't with, exaggerate. with, with, with but, what you were... Oh, no, 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 it was fantastic. It resonates okay. really well with what we've I been discussing. I hope you meant fantastic in the sense that you were dreaming, fantasizing. So... Yeah. Um, 
since this is an international conference uh, and it's a scientific conference, uh, we want to invite uh, the audience to ask questions as well. So I'd like to um, have some more light in the audience, if that's possible. I hope that as a good Stalinist, you distributed the questions I'm a, in advance. And, uh, uh, I am actually a Protestant on that, which means that I, I actually want people to ask questions. Sorry for being a Protestant. Um, no, 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 I totally agree. I'm so sorry we don't have time for this. I'm no, 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 please, let's, we do have time. No, 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 Slava. No, 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 Slava. No, you we know do why? Have time for because this. you know that Protestantism is for me one step from atheism. Predestination means God doesn't care for us. It means God, pre you are in advance lost or saved. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, uh, I'm losing. No, 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 okay. no. It's, it's, it's good. It's just that, uh, so think of a question. Uh, the lights are going to shine in the audience uh, as well. That would be good, yes. Prosim prežgite luči tudi v dvorani. Vid, ali kdor koli drug. And, you know, when uh, the lights are there, and if you have a question, please raise your hand, and people will bring you a microphone, and this is how it will operate. So, is anyone back there? Is there a master or someone on the switchboard that can actually put lights in the audience? Are we alone here? <laughs> they left us, Slavo. What are we going to do? <laughs> oh, so 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 the director of the general director of this institution will bring the light. Until then, um, Slavo, uh, I, I, I stopped you, but you were on a roll. I think you you, you had some really oh, another thing that I wanted to ask you more a little bit was about alienation. Yeah. Uh, you stress this idea, oh, thank you, we have the lights. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, alienation, this is another thing that you kept stressing in your talk. And you also, you know, made a subtle, but not really so subtle, um, move against the praxis uh, school of the Yugoslavia, uh, you know, the Yugoslavian Marxists who kind of liked this alienation, who kind of liked Marx of the manuscripts of uh, 1844. Which are for me the worst, <laughs> the most dangerous Marx, if you ask me. If you are looking in Marx for the roots of later Stalinism, they are there. Mm -hmm. And oh, no, really? but you know what? No, because they, they were obviously like, I mean, they hated Stalin with all their guts. Okay, I also have, let's say, some problems. <laughs> Stalin. Stalin? Okay. No, but, but you know, now, now for those who are from here and old enough to remember it, you know what was for me the moment of truth of praxis? That when socialism began disintegrating, they were totally powerless, totally unable to offer an alternative, even a minimal one. If anything, they become nostalgically, they quickly made a pact with, even with Communist Party apparatus, like, my God, now everything is in danger and let's pull together all our forces. This utter, utter inability to find a new formula mm -hmm. there. But uh, uh, just another thing about master, that's the master I don't like. You know, uh, like, when, usually when I say, ha ha, show me one example of anarchism which worked. Anarchism, local pre-representative democracy. Uh, now, no longer, but a couple of years ago, the answer I was given was Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Now, I just laugh. If there was a mega master there, it was Hugo Chavez extremely strong state, mega master, and it was only within that state that uh, local authorities uh, uh, work and so on and so on. Mm. So uh, now you will say, is there a danger against, nonetheless, I'm well aware that with alienation comes the danger that the alienated power, uh, no? But I think uh, there are ways to prevent it, terror, but not terror towards the people. Mm -hmm. Terror the other way around. I'm for a limited, even artificial terror. If we, uh, against well, those in power. Here, if there is a Stalin I like, <laughs> conditionally, it's the Stalin of 34, 35. Because till that point, Stalin 
got it that in purges, just higher bureaucracy is sacrificing the lower. And then Stalin turned it around and appealed to ordinary people to denounce those up. Mm -hmm. And the, the number were incredibly... Okay, losing time, you have a question. No, no, please. Yes, there, there, there is a question. Uh, there's a couple of them. The, I think there is a microphone coming. I hear you, but... Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, just, I will let you finish, but do you know the irony that every good English nationalist will tell you? That the English language, that is now the world language, is something so specific that many Englishmen and Americans don't recognize themselves in it. That's, they that's are why the Brexit true, happened, yeah. yeah they, are, they are the true losers. The English that we are speaking is, I read an analysis, is the closest real group of people which is identified with this international English are probably Singapore bankers. Sorry, please go on, sorry. Yeah? Yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, I think that if there is something to learn today is that this big, what you called big tech, that, uh, that the only realist way we have to contain it is a stronger state. Do you have another solution? Under the control of the people, of course, all that, but strong state regulation. I think I will give you even another uh, version here. My good friend, he's also known as a Slovene politician, but this doesn't matter. My good friend, uh, uh, Luca, look the moon, casually, <laughs> if we speak English. <laughs> Luca Methods gave me an idea that when this uh, something, not TV, but I think this infrared or whatever, uh, infrared, uh, uh, infrared to bake things and some invention, uh, one company developed it and wanted to monopolize it. And it was the American state which wisely cancelled the copyright so that we have competition and so on. Strong, the paradox is that, yes, market sometimes has good effects if it's tightly controlled by the state. Without the state, we would already have been in neo-feudalism, without the market. So I, in this sense, I, I, I think that I like this... Uh, ethical shift that happened in the last 20 years, maybe this is my secret Stalinism, where you know how till 20 years ago to denounce people to authorities was considered bad. Mm -hmm. Now whistleblowers are our heroes, practically. What I just want to, with all my criticism of Russia and so on, want to point out is that uh, Again, that was my basic point. This an anarcho-capitalism and new forms of censorship and so on are two sides of the same time. At the level of political discourse, when people say, but you can say anything, oh, look what happened with Julian Assange. I mean, there are such strict limits. And uh, I will give you, if I may, in a slightly arrogant way, my own example here. I wrote texts defending Ukraine. They were so-so here and there published. Then I wrote two texts, the last two, where I was critical not so much against Ukraine as against the way some political aspects of the crisis. Like, are you aware how the West is using the war to force Ukraine into really neo-colonialist privatization. Do you know that over one third of the best land in Ukraine, the Chernozium and so on, if it's not 
occupied by Russians is already in Western hands and all that, I couldn't publish it. They say, no, it's too one-sided and so on. Or, unfortunately, Ukraine is here wrong. They totally support Israel. They claimed Ukraine is like Israel, which is, for me, madness. Nobody wanted to publish it. Uh, the, uh, you can, of course, in some marginal, but it's good to become aware of how censored the space is, the public space. It's us, ours, in liberal democracies. It's absolutely, sorry. There's many more questions, uh, gentlemen. But I'm so, oh, yeah, there's a microphone for you. Thank you for the talk, uh, Professor. My name is Anish. I recently finished my PhD from Dublin City University, and I'm visiting University of Ljubljana. Originally, I'm from uh, the Maoist insurgency, India, like Slovo would know. We have been fighting against the Indian state for a very long time, uh, and now we have accepted that we need a master. What I wanted to ask you is, I agree with you. Uh, could you speak a little slower? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, what I was trying to say is that I come from a part of India that has been against the Indian state. We have been fighting the Maoist insurgency and now we have accepted the fact that we need a government and we have been trying to participate. But the question is true that we need a state and true that expertise is important. But what do you do when the master is stupid? Like in the India's case, like you know, our prime minister has been going around asking people to uh, drink cow piss. Like what, what do you do in that case? Uh, could you just repeat, uh, I didn't catch it uh, yeah. too well either. Could you just repeat when the master is, what do you do when the master is? When, when the master is stupid, are we, or when the experts surrounding the master is stupid, are we allowed to overthrow then? Are we allowed to have a revolution then? Like, oh, my, my God, I'm, I'm always for violent revolutions. That's not a problem. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that if you are in a regime, when, if the master is stupid, things go bad, then this is a bad regime. I want a master in a position where it doesn't matter if he is stupid or not. Look, do you think Elizabeth II was not stupid? Okay, he, she had some sense for proper measure and so on and so on, but, uh, but uh, Hegel knew, Hegel was the first one who Precisely, we are here as Hegelians who knew this. We should learn something from this paradox that emancipatory revolutions like October revolutions and other who were meant to dispense with the master ended up with the figure of the master which is much harsher than the usual Western master. In some sense, I'm ready to say, although still Nazism is worse than Soviet Union, but in some sense, uh, in Stalinism, the master was, had more power than Hitler. I studied this in detail. Hitler still had to make compromises with Gauleiter in this region, that region, and so on, and so on. It was a different position. So again, my point is that... Uh, I, I, okay, I'm even ready to go a step further. I'm a pessimist here. Let's say, and this was the usual story, from Zimbabwe to I don't know where. You get a master which at the beginning brought hope, and then he turned most corrupted and so on. Well, kill him. <laughs> there is no problem. Kill him, liquidate him, and so on and so on. I think maybe this is even a necessary step of every revolution. That a revolution has to end by, by killing their own. The problem is leaders. The problem is only, does this have to happen? Because I'm an old pro-Jacobin. Does this have to, I'm, I mean, I think that three quarters of Jacobin terror in France is a, is a myth. And I'm so glad to learn from British historians, you know, usually those who want to prove that the origin of uh, revolutionary terror, ultra-Stalinism, is the, uh, the, the liquidation of Danton. 
Read to British his, uh, the British historians. They were right. It's proven now by English archives that Anton was paid by the British. And so, but that's another story. What I want to say is my vision is much more tragic here. As Hegel says about the Alexander the Great, the uh, great wisdom of a master is to die at a proper moment, mm -hmm. not too late. Now, you know that my friends in England, I love this theory, paranoiac, claim that maybe Elizabeth II is not dead, but just Charles got nervous, like, you live forever when I will be king, so they retired her to some home. And so, but, no, but you see what I mean. Maybe I'm more and more tempted in my pessimism to say that we have a revolution which does the necessary job, and then you need revolution against the revolution. And the true problem is there. How this revolution against the first revolution how to prevent it from simply becoming the counter-revolution. But my view is here tragic, which means uh, illusion, revolutionary illusion is necessary. I don't believe that in, I don't believe in realist revolution. You know in advance your limitation and so on and so on. But Sorry. No, great. I have a question yeah. on that, um, but I want to open it uh, to the audience as much as possible. So, please, uh, raise your hand and, uh, yes, uh, a microphone will be brought to you. So ah, it's there already behind you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, uh, So, I agree with you. Uh, uh, but, go to but. No, there is no but. Oh, okay. <laughs> Still, yet. <laughs> I agree with you, state is, uh, is necessary, uh, strong state. Uh, I like to have electricity, I like to have healthcare, I, I, I want someone to take care of this. Uh, but <laughs> we, we uh, don't have just domestic capital, okay. domestic... Do have that in Mexico or, sorry, could you be... Domestic, domestic. domestic. We don't have domestic capitalism. We don't have, uh, uh, you know, like domestic problems. Only domestic markets yeah, that the yeah. state should should take care of. We live in a globalized capitalism. Uh, we have excesses in global markets. We have excesses in in nature. We have a climate change and and. Uh, well, basically, my question is: Is state enough? Uh, who is the ultimate master who will fix these things? Uh, uh, there is, the situation is much more tragic. I didn't have time to develop the home line, but I'm well aware if I, that's how I, in the longer version of the text, interpret that quote from Hannah Arendt and Aaron Schuster. You know, a uh, master is not a real master. I don't believe in ma the master in the traditional sense that something has real authority. To act as a master is always a moment of madness. It's a fake. You fail. So what do we have to do? If this is your point, I, namely that the, I totally agree with you, and that's why I mentioned that, uh, but it's not the only problem, that uh, uh, northwest of United States, southwest of Canada, no? Some, this is what I always ask my green ecological friends who are for local action. Okay, what would you do locally? You would look there at the countryside and you would discover that probably uh, 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 the area around Seattle and Vancouver, uh, uh, Southwest Canada, Northwest United States are by common standards ecologically relatively well protected. They're doing proper and so on and that what happened there is just a local effect, heat dome of a global process which is affecting at least, I don't know what is happening in the south, the whole of northern hemisphere, but in the south also. I read that in the southern third of Chile, they have now drought already for a decade or more, 
and it's again, it's some disturbance in the air circulation which doesn't have anything to do with them. So precisely, I think, if this was your point, I agree that the, the crucial thing is some kind of a federation. That's why I'm absolutely against a state in the sense of full sovereignty. We will, the only way out that I see for all problems that we have, war, uh, 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 global warming, immigrations, and so on, is some much tighter, much more obligatory even, form of international federation and so on. Otherwise, I simply don't see how. Imagine a new immigrant crisis, millions coming and so on. How will this be done? It's a formula of new war. Now, leftists are saying, open the borders. Yes, then you will have everywhere what now will happen in Italy and already did happen in Sweden. You will simply have populists in power. I think that, I think that the task is, again, new forms of global international cooperation, and the problem is that the direction now goes exactly in the opposite direction, in the, in the stronger state sovereignty. So uh, uh, here, I, uh, I don't have a clear solution. I'm more and more a pessimist. One solution is we didn't, at least in the developed countries, we didn't yet suffer enough. Even Ukraine, which is closer, it's still something that you watch there on the screen and so on. You know, it's, it's not part of our reality. We will have to suffer more. We need a stronger shock because our ability to the, okay, I'll put it like this. Uh, 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 another one who is not here, my, uh, uh, who did this, Adrian Johnston, mm -hmm. American Fred. I don't always agree with him theoretically. But he nicely formulated this paradox, how today the problem is not that we don't know. The truth is out there. Even the most disgusting conference that I know, it was over a year ago, I think, in Glasgow, Global Warming. They said all things. We are approaching the end, humanity, survival is under threat, and so on, and so on. And then absolutely nothing happened. Even So uh, this reminds me of uh, something that I learned, if some of you are old enough, in the old uh, self-management Yugoslav socialism which was a very interesting system. I am more and more fascinated by it. Not in any sense of being for it, but you know, uh, I don't want to name names to get involved, but the system, I can guarantee this to you, at least in the last 10, 15 years, functioned not only independently of do you believe in it or not, but the condition of its functioning was that people didn't take it seriously. I had two friends at the Central Committee, young guys, rather stupid, although very honest. They believed in the system. They thought it's true self-management. They lost their job <laughs> because they were considered dangerous. Like, my God, if they take it seriously, it's one step from uh, dissidence and so on. So I think that this, what was once self-management Yugoslavia is now all, all the world. All the world is moving into what I call, with very cynical reference towards myself, because if I'm something clinically, I think, it's an obsessional neurotic. Obsessional neurotic does things for a precise reason, to prevent that not to change something, but to make it sure that nothing will change. 
immediately I will finish. Mlad and Dolar long ago uh, drew my attention to that wonderful text by George Orwell, who already in late 30s said this, that radical leftists talk all the time about the necessity to change, but it's kind of a superstitious wager. Let's talk about change and maybe nothing will change. And I am like this, sorry, all the time. This is, I remember when I was in an analysis. I talked all the time. Why? Because I was afraid that if I stop talking for a second, the analyst may ask me a really difficult question. <laughs> you, are not, you are not an analyst right now, so... Uh, I'm not, but you, you see what I mean? I think we are in that terrible state where we talk about ecology and so on, just not to do it. Mm. There's a, another question by the gentleman with the hat. Uh, uh, gentleman or comrade, take your <laughs> side. I said gentleman. It's not good for you, but okay. <laughs> I just have uh, one question. Please. Uh, yes, please be. Uh, yeah, for some sorry. reason, we don't hear very well, so be uh, slow and eloquent. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, we can hear you, but try uh -huh. to be... Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I just have uh, one question. You said uh, that um, um, the true uh, freedom doesn't come from selecting from the outside uh, the different forms of ideology and seeing Marxism as the best thing. Yeah. But you must already believe in it to understand it as freedom. So, if I understood it, does this mean that it's not the selection of experiences that gives you freedom, yeah. it's the intensity of an experience that gives you freedom. And if this analogy is true, does, uh, what is the greatest danger today to intensity of experience, to being uh, like a true proletariat that believes in proletariat, proletarianism and that finds freedom in this, in all the different forms, in whether it's Catholicism, atheism, what is killing the freedom in all these things, the, the potential of their freedom? Okay, uh, thank you. No, I, am, I want to, with all my authoritarian excesses, I... Believe me, uh, I remain an old Marxist, but in a liberal, good sense. You know, um, what a Marxist, I never had this dismissal, hardline Marxist of liberal freedom doesn't matter, it's just uh, fake. No, this freedom of the press, blah, 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 these are very precious things. The lesson of the left is just that you have to have certain material institutional conditions, not just written rules, but also unwritten rules. And the true problem for the left is freedom, even if it's guaranteed by the law and so on, is not enough. Like, what is your freedom if you don't have health care? So that you have to... And this is where ideological struggle, here I am for my totalitarian side comes. Do you remember why Obamacare was cancelled? All the propaganda against Obamacare was it deprives us of a freedom. Mm -hmm. No, the state will decide. First, this was not true. You would have been still able to choose. But the point is that, uh, that in some sense, actual freedom means a limitation of formal freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the, it, 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 for me, but now it works less and less. We are again in Slovenia also becoming too free in the bad sense. For example, for healthcare, you know. <laughs> yeah, the state system still exists, but you have to wait for two, three years mm -hmm. at least. And so a cynical liberal, cynical liberal would have said, no problem, you have a freedom. Either you choose your health or you choose... <laughs> to die. Yeah, to die or whatever. No, I don't want this freedom. I want basic things, education, uh, healthcare, and some others to be... This is what I meant by good alienation. Oh. To simply be there, available, so that you don't have to think about them. I have friends, for example, uh, I have friends... I will not name him, not to embarrass him from the United States. One of them is even maybe here, I think. 
who had a difficult heart disease, and it was just above, although he had very good uh, 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 health care at the university, but it was just above what his health care system covered. So it was a desperate situation. His wife helped him by playing on the stock market and somehow they, you know, uh, this is what I meant by good alienation. There are freedoms which are false freedoms. In my last text on Ukraine, maybe some of you knew it, although it was only in English, I quote the example of my evil son, and he is really evil, he is my son, no DNA needed. Uh, you know, he played this childish game with me already 15 years ago. We were at a table, there was on his side of the table salt, and I asked him, can you pass me the salt? He said, yes, I can, and did nothing. Yes, that's a very... So, uh, 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 but, you know, in some sense, he had another freedom that I denounced, that I, uh, sorry, not denounced, that I abandoned. The freedom to read these statements in a different way. He had another choice. I, he decided to take my demand literally and answer it literally or simply do it. Now you will say this is an abstract example. But for those of you who are Slovenian, you remember that complication Jansa, the government, some judges that Slovenia sent to Europe. Mm -hmm. Did they not do exactly the same thing as my son? The government should only, how do you pronounce Uzeti Naznanje, uh, take cognizance of or whatever. Just register. No, they took this literally. Mm. They took this literally. That's, that's in this sense, in this sense, I, I, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, freedom matters. Actual freedom. Freedom which effectively works. Effectively works, not this abstract freedom. And I think today this freedom that all this uh, mask of freedom, take precarious workers. In some sense, of course, they are much more free than us. You choose the time of your work. If you are Uber driver, you do it or not. You are free to get health care or not. They have a lot of freedom. But no, thank you. I want order there. So that, uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, no, 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 don't be sorry. We have more questions. Yes. Uh, where do you place the media in the modern power dynamic? Thank you for this very short... Media. Media, yeah, the media. This is a very... Uh, my spontaneous reaction, but this is my private Stalinism, <laughs> is that in my ideal state, I would prohibit Facebook, Instagram, and all that, and if you are caught using it more than 10 minutes a day, in the Stalinist way, you would be compelled to, I don't know, uh, one month five hours a day to clean public toilets, something I, like I think that. a lot of parents would agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this, I, 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 I just think my only problem here is that, uh, you know what, the problem here is double. First, don't exaggerate the problem. People say post-truth era. But think about the Cold War 50, 70 years ago, Okay, it wasn't this pluralized post-truth, but it was still alternate truth. If you listen to the Western version, it was totally different. There were not less lies at that point. Just there was one clearly hegemonic lie. Don't exaggerate. Uh, my problem is still another one. Here I remain a traditional Marxist. It is not that, it is not that, uh, that I wouldn't put the blame on this media as such. I think something is changing into economical, social structure of our society and so on, you know. And this is why media are used the way they are, they are used. So I think to see this 
under quotation marks, bad role that the media are playing, I wouldn't blame the media themselves. Okay, um, so do we have more questions? A gentleman wants another question, so we'll take it. I'm uh, disappointed only you, it's only the right-wingers which have <laughs> priority, I just noticed this. For them it's left-wingers. Yeah, but I yeah, so uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, anarcho-capitalism, uh, clash between the strong state and the global tech, where does the traditional concept of, you know, uh, 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 invisible hand of capitalism fit into this uh, being a master and kind of keeping everything in harmony? It's a very good question. Again, uh, uh, first, uh, if we don't idealize the invisible hand, I like this notion because it points, and Jacques Lacan uses, I only discovered the quote now, this very, he said, I am stupid, not more than others, but he said that a certain stupidity is very, a basic element of being part of a symbolic order. Stupidity means you don't dominate the effects of what you are saying, and so on, and so on. So, in this sense, yes, invisible hand, but on the other hand, there, so, if invisible hand means we are caught in processes and we cannot count on the effects of our act. We don't know what will come out of them. And here I'm very critical of Marx. Marx thought that Hegel's notion of Lise der Vernunft, cunning of reason, only holds for alienated societies. My God, but if the whole point of communist revolutions, especially Soviet Union, tells us something is that precisely there also you get something totally different from what you, from what you plan and so on and so on. So, uh, 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 your uh, question about uh, in, invisible hand, you know what interests me? Uh, uh, Frederick Glemson, my friend, pointed this out, that of course we have to be against conspiracy. Alenka Zupancic wrote on this a nice text. Of course we have to be against conspiracy theories, for a very precise reason, how they function, and so on. But this absolutely doesn't mean that there are no conspiracies, and even big conspiracies. For example, there are now studies, this is another censored domain, incidentally. You remember the 2008 financial crackdown, or what? It wasn't, oh, things just run out of the hand. It's now absolutely proven that it was done as a well-planned maneuver by some big banks and so on and so on. And of course, nobody was punished and so on and so on. So uh, 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 while all the entire process is run by invisible hand in the not in the sense that there is a higher power, but in the sense that we don't control the effects, that system has its own logic. I would just nonetheless like to add two things. First, uh, within this global invisibility, there are things which are happening and where one has to look for, for very concrete speculations and so on. And second thing, which is really a sad one, but what is the invisible hand is a bad hand. What is invisible hand is pushing us against uh, collective suicide. We no longer can rely on invisible hand bringing out the ultimate, the best uh, uh, conclusion. No, I think, I think if the system is left to its own logic, we are approaching some kind of uh, collective suicide. This is actually the, the question that I wanted to pose uh, to you, and it will be the last question uh, for tonight. Uh, so there is still hope for you, a Stalinist. <laughs> oh, okay, yes, yes, absolutely the last question for tonight. Uh, it's a little bit, well, maybe it's a little bit philosophical, but it's in practical yeah. terms it's not. It's called, what is to be done? Uh, basically, the Lenin, the Lenin position the answer is clear, in a way. We know what is to be done. Uh, 
And for Marx, it's also obvious what is to be done. Whereas I think for Hegel, you could make the argument that you can never know what is to be done in the sense that you can never know, and this is somehow related, of course, to the question yeah. of the invisible hand of the theodicy, mm. that, that you can never know that you cannot jump over your own time, and therefore you cannot know what goal uh, you should be oriented towards. This uh, is a wonderful question. You know why? Because this, for me, is the ultimate reason that I consider myself a Hegelian. For me, what we need today, I use sometimes this phrase, is the materialist reversal of Hegel into Ma of Marx into Hegel, back to Hegel. Because, you know, Hegel is usually a dead idiot, absolute knowing who thought he knew everything. No, Hegel says, Hegel says openly, the future, we cannot talk about it. He accepted that all our projections for future are, there is no meta-language, Hegel knew. In the, all, we cannot step on our back and look into the future. Our idea of future is always somehow uh, contained into our present situation. That's why the effect is always uh, uh, another one. And here, Marx is too idealist for me because Marx thought that this holds for the entire history, but with the proletarian revolution, I simplify it very much, we have the first historical subject who is doing something and knows what it, her, they is doing. He thought that proletarian revolution is the moment of transparency. And that's why I think Hegel is needed more than ever today. Because although, ah, another thing, although this doesn't mean that Hegel, that's very interesting, Hegel is usually dismissed as a crazy uh, 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 speculative idealist, but you must notice that in his empirical judgments on concrete things, Hegel is something so, inc says something so incredibly penetrative looking into the future. Check his philosophy of history introduction. When he speaks there, this was given as a lecture in 1820 around. When uh, he speaks about Russia and at another point, United States, you know what Hegel said? It's too early to say next century, 20th, will be their epoch of United States and Russia. He saw this, and even with the best of Marxists, you find this. For example, he was, although less than Marx, but you know what Engels, Engels, the stupid Engels, nobody like him, wrote around, I think, 1882. It's breathtaking. He not only predicted one of the few, there were just two, three sociologists, journalists, World War I, but then in one fragment Engels said, and if Germany will fight a war against Russia and France, Britain at the same time, and since Germany will probably lose, he even said this war will count, he was probably lucky here, that, that uh, there will be around 10 million dead. Today's official number is 9,800,000. Then he said this may lead to a revolution in Russia. Lenin, mm. uh, sorry, uh, Engels. And, and then he said, it's breathtaking, if Germany will lose, some two decades later, there will be another revenge war from Germany. So being a speculative idealist, that's what I want to say, doesn't mean you are caught in stupid situations. And a true genius of Hegel, only today we can read it. You know what is Hegel's last text? It's a... Uh, a uh, critique of British, this new election which spreads uh, wider uh, uh, towards larger participation of voter, everybody, uh, of voting, uh, well, first step towards a uh, bill, reform bill or what. Hegel's critique is not as people simply think reactionary. It is basically. But he says what may happen is that 
the lot of people who will now be included will be manipulated. And then Hegel introduces there, or in another text, another wonderful notion, not just uh, 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 pebble, as pebble proletarians, but pebble bourgeoisie, this vulgar new rich, and, <coughs> and they may manipulate the new poor so that the manipulation will be even worse than now. Mm. So, uh, in this sense, I think that for Hegel to analyze society after his death, we are in his water. Hegel, this is Hegel's topic. Hegel is always interested in how things which are well meant turn into their opposite. For example, Hegel would have been enthusiastic about this, how come that the second half of 19th century, which was perceived as the era of, at least in Europe, not elsewhere, gradual progress and so on, out of nowhere, World War I exploded. Hegel would have loved to analyze this, or why fascism, why Stalinism, and so on, and so on. Hegel, Hegel's point is precisely this. How can the best ideas go wrong? So, uh, in, in the, this is for me, again, but now I come to final point. Thank to you. you. No, 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 uh, 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 with you, that this doesn't mean, you can feel this in Hegel, that we should do nothing. Oh, we, it mm -hmm. will always go wrong. No, Hegel at the same time knew that if you do nothing, it will be even worse. You have to take a risk, it will turn wrong, and then maybe the second time something better will emerge. Mm -hmm. For example, people read Hegel in a totally wrong way when they think in his critique that he is rejecting Jacobin terror. Yes, he is critical, but critical in the sense that it was necessary. You, it was not a choice in the sense that, oh, shall we go into Jacobin way or shall we just make a gradual... No, you had to go mm -hmm. through it. In this sense, I think Hegel's time in, is just arriving. All right. Well, uh, this, is, this has been brilliant. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Slava. But before we officially thank you, I want to invite you tomorrow to more talks, uh, to more philosophy. Mladen Dolar will uh, speak um, at 11 o'clock in Kosovelova Dvorana, uh, followed by Jamila Maskat, two of my very favorite uh, people in the world. So please uh, come join us for more Do talks. Why? Jamila is feminine. Why is she your favorite person in the world? Sorry? Uh, just one of the favorite persons oh, in the world. I just wanted to be dirty. That, okay. okay, okay. So it's really time for us to finish. Yeah. Uh, please come tomorrow. Uh, please come uh, on uh, Sunday. And uh, yes, before it's we Saturday. say goodnight. Uh, sorry, Saturday. Yes, I'm already also beyond. But um, yes, thank you, Slava. No, I'm sorry if I disappointed you, but I think... If we do not, uh, do you agree at least with this? Maybe something that I said are crazy. But if we are not ready to confront all these antagonisms, problems, if we still play the game of, we just need to stick to the old liberal democracy, we are lost. Mm -hmm. Just one thing to really finish, I'm sorry. You know, the tragedy is this one. Here I feel sorry for Ukrainians and others. They still are within what Jürgen Habermas called Nachholen, the catch-up revolution. Although not all of them, they are not stupid, but many of them think we just want to join Europe. But Europe itself is in a deep crisis. We have more and more, that's for me the fundamental fact of United States and Europe, that we have discontents, uh, 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 Podemos in Spain, Gilets uh, uh, in France, France and so on, there is a large public discontent which cannot be translated into existing liberal democratic political forum. Point two, something will have to be done with our electoral system because I spoke with a Chinese guy who was very cynical, official, but intelligent. He told me, you know what's your problem? Ecology and all this now 
needs planning for 20, 30 years ahead. And your electoral system is pushing you into how will I be re-elected in two years. And he told me cynically that we in China, you know, we know who is in power. We don't worry about this, but this enables us to make plans. We are thinking about 2050, even later. Later, and with the problems that we have now, I don't know how, but I hope we all agree we will have to find a way to enact this long-term and more global planning. Otherwise, we are lost. Now, I believe me or not, really finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Slavoj.